Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here to be kicking off the summit with this first general session, Living Boldly After Breast Cancer. As Desiree shared, my name is Emma Vivian. I am the face-to-face -face coordinator for Los Angeles and Southern California. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2018 when I was 29, triple positive breast cancer. And uh, I'm so thrilled to be here today um, to talk to these other am amazing women who we have um, on, the, on the presentation today. First up, we have Andrea Santiago. Andrea is a licensed clinical social worker and board certified sex therapist. In 2014, Andrea opened her private practice, 363 Therapy, and she specializes in individual and couples therapy. Her focus is on helping couples improve intimacy, connectivity after life altering events. Andrea has her own personal cancer journey, having been diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015. We will then be hearing from Jamil Rivers. Jamil is the founder and CEO of the Chrysalis Initiative, and she's also the board president of Metaviva. At 39 years old, she was diagnosed with de novo metastatic breast cancer, and she became an advocate using her knowledge base and experiences to help advance legislative policy, medical research, and customized support to better meet the needs of individuals who have breast cancer, particularly metastatic black patients and other disparate groups. And then lastly, we'll be hearing from Anna Krollman. Anna is a young breast cancer survivor, infertility warrior, and beauty enthusiast. She founded My Cancer Chic as a platform to inspire others to thrive through adversity with self-confidence and style. Anna shares her passion for wellness, style and beauty, as well as the ups and downs of facing cancer and motherhood after loss. Throughout this talk, we would love to be hearing from all of you and to be hearing about your questions for our lovely panelists. So please do submit your questions in the chat box throughout the session and we will be getting to them at the end. So uh, with that being said, I myself am so excited to be hearing uh, from everybody today and what they have to say. These are all, all subjects that are, of course, like all of us here are very close to my heart. So I'm honored to be passing the mic over to Andrea Santiago. Thank you, thank you, Emma. Um, I was thinking and I almost didn't present. They had asked me and I said, I'm really not feeling very bold. I'm not feeling that I'm living my life boldly because it's been a rough few years for all of us in different ways. And when I presented originally you know, um, in 2017, you know, if 2017 me could see me now dealing with a very different life. I don't think anybody could have um, expected this. Then I thought that's really not fair. I shouldn't present only when I'm feeling bold and great and happy and enthusiastic. Um, I should present when I'm struggling myself and figuring out how to have moments of joy, because that's really what I've learned over the last few years. I'm, I'm trying to find moments. You know, in um, 2017, when I presented, I was married, I had two stepkids, um, I was doing in-person therapy, and it was awesome. Today, I'm divorced, I live alone, um, and I had to switch my entire practice to telehealth. Um, and then we have COVID, and, you know, the, um, I think as survivors, or not survivors, but, you know, as people who are walking through this, I've been in remission, and I expected the anxiety to change. I expected my anxiety about breast cancer reoccurrence to lessen. And, and it's made it different, right? And COVID's made it different because it really um, changed how I interacted with people. You know, when we're talking about intimacy, we're not just talking about romantic intimacy. We're talking about intimacy with our family being able to touch it, touch our relatives, um, have physical connectivity, meet new people and have physical connectivity with new people. So redefining intimacy, you know, I know one of the things that comes up a lot when I'm talking um, to these groups is how do we date post-cancer? How do we date during cancer? You know, how do we date during a pandemic? I think a lot of us are, how do we date during a pandemic when you're immune? <clears throat> 
is very challenging. Um, how do we even socialize and create social intimacy? And those are all things that I've been struggling with myself and trying to um, navigate. You know, it's I'm part of a therapist group and we realized that for the first time, all of the therapists are kind of walking the same path as the people I'm working with, right? So people are home and I'm home. People are scared and I'm scared. It's not me trying to guide somebody with information. My toolbox changed, things I would tell people, plan a vacation, um, go see your friends, go online. Not everything was feasible um, during COVID and during these last few years. So now things, I'm trying to figure out how to live boldly. You know, what steps do I feel comfortable with in this new environment that we have? You know, I am I comfortable meeting my friends for lunch um, and creating intimacy in a way that I think we all need to look for individually. I have a lot of moments of joy. Um, I'm not, I'm no longer looking for big blocks of like end of the rainbow type of I'm, I've hit happiness. And I think 2017 me was definitely like, we've got this in the bag. We are, you know, at the end of whatever, and it's going to be, you know, smooth sailing. I'm in a very different spot right now, but I've learned to connect with my friends in a different way, you know, finding smaller things, finding joy in doing stuff with my puppy, right? Um, a lot of the Zoom meetings, um, doing connectivity with, uh, whether it's um, a bingo night or a happy hour. And I got really creative. And I know a lot of us got really creative to how do we maintain connectivity and in intimacy? Because that's what it's about. Ultimately, it's connection. It's why we all gather here because we are connected with like-minded people, people who've walked our similar path, right? We're not all walking the same path, but we understand each other. So right now, you know, I'm, I'm still navigating it. So I don't have a checklist on how to do this with great ease, but I'm finding that I wanna do things that bring me joy and I don't wanna do things. And I'm being better at saying, you know what? That doesn't bring me joy. And I don't wanna spend my time doing something that I don't enjoy anymore, right? I want to spend my time doing things, saying yes a little more, but saying yes within my comfort zone because I still have um, a lot of anxiety around COVID. You know, um, I have some health anxiety. I, I know many, you know, some of us had to pause medical treatment, doctor's appointments during this process and now are picking it up again. And so that opens, it's, um, it was almost, it, it, for me, it was a reality check of like, oh yeah, I forgot this is a world that I operated in. I was doing a lot of my medical appointments, telehealth, and I was very lucky that I could do that. But now I'm back in this world of, okay, let's get back on track medically. Um, but I'm trying to laugh more. I'm trying to spend time with my friends, spend time with my family, travel in ways that I feel comfortable, right? Doing things that um, connect me. You know, I, I, I think everything in moderation. I picked up a lot of hobbies during this last few times, right? I, I learned how to bake um, and I learned that baking and eating everything you're baking is not, you know, in my best decision, right? So when we um, talk about finding the joy, I find that a small piece of cake really brings me joy that I baked. An entire cake makes me feel like, ugh. Um, and then navigating intimacy. You know, how do I start dating? How do I start connecting and doing it in a way that feels comfortable? I don't have the answer. I know it's taking it in small steps, whether it's online, whether it's asking people and saying, hey, could you set me up with someone? You know, how do we navigate these health boundaries. And it's been, for me, really comfortable um, saying to somebody, you know, have you traveled? You know, we all have our feelings around, you know, what our COVID comfort level is and being okay with speaking up, really being okay with saying, this is what I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable meeting you outside, but not indoors, 
I'm comfortable being masked and not being masked. I'm comfortable hugging and not hugging, you know, and trying to find our people and um, our way again. You know, it, it just looks different. Life looks different and life is not always fantastic. But there are so many positive moments. There are so many moments of silly laughter that we can find, right? They, they go hand in hand. There's nothing wrong with the tears. They need to come. We need to shed them. We do. There, it is the healthiest thing to cry. Um, at the same time, it is not all tears. It's the walks outside. It's sometimes like grasping for straws of like, I really like the way the sun looks today or how awesome are the stars? You know, it's being proud of myself for small things that I did, whatever. I completed a puzzle. Like sometimes that was it. That was my moment of joy. Um, and I've really gotten better. And that's what I want everybody to take away. That's my big tip, right? Is finding moments of joy, moments of connectivity, lessening your expectation of the end of the rainbow happiness, because it's not there. It's just not. Um, but every day we can find a moment, two moments to go, I had joy in that moment. I laughed in that moment. I, and you know, we string a bunch of moments together and that makes life. That balances us out sometimes when we're dealing with these great moments of stress and sorrow. Um, so I challenge all of you to think about just today, like what were your moments of joy today? What was, I found a new coffee shop and I had a really good latte. And that was my mom moment of joy. Did it right before a meeting and it was perfect. Um, so thank you for listening. I wish you all great luck in finding your moments of joy. And I look forward to your questions. Um, Emma? Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, there's lots of people in the comments saying, thank you for showing up when you don't feel bold. And actually sometimes that was the boldest thing that you could do. And thank you so much for your vulnerability. I know there's a lot of people that are watching right now that are, are just saying, yeah, me too. The past few years, regardless of what your diagnosis is, would have kicked anybody's butt, you know? So mm -hmm. thank you so much. I think that's so important to think about what does joy look like? What does joy look like for you? So thank you. We're going to pass over to Jamil Rivers now. And again, reminder, Jamil is uh, the CEO of the, Chrys the Chrysalis Initiative and also the board president of MetaViber. Thank you so much, Emma. And I'm so excited to join the YSC Summit today. Um, I was diagnosed in uh, 2018. And YSC was a real big resource for me when I was first diagnosed, being diagnosed under the age of 45. And my story started out really just in shock because um, I was the typical married mom of three and just busy executive, busy mom. And, um, you know, it was winter time, everybody got their colds. Um, my turn came and my cold didn't go away. And so, you know, went to the primary doctor, asked for, you know, and she prescribed an antibiotic. A couple weeks later, I got an asthma pump, still no change. And um, so then finally, I just asked for an ultrasound and a chest scan and come to find out I have lesions all over my body. So I am 39 years old, no strong family history, um, had already gone through a cancer diagnosis and treatment with my husband with colon cancer. So I was really shocked to, you know, it was, you know, hello, my kids are not supposed to have two parents with cancer. And, um, you know, my husband was disabled at the time. And so mm -hmm. I just thought, well, you know, I saw how long it took for him <clears throat> to get his disability approved. And I wanted to make sure that the family was still uh, together and stable. And so I just decided to um, continue to work. And so I ended up not disclosing to my job that I had breast cancer. I decided to, you know, get my eyebrows tattooed and um, shave my head, get a wig that looked like my hair and just 
continue to go to work every day. So I tapped in and leaned on a lot of support resource, resources that were available and just took it one day at a time. Um, really got involved with advocacy right away um, so I could learn as much as I possibly could and was shocked to learn that Black women were dying from breast cancer at such a disproportionately higher rate than their white counterparts. And I would always hear from all of these organizations that I was connected to that it was due to social determinants of health and social economic issues. Um, however, when I started, you know, um, just taking it day by day, getting my care and other women started coming up to me and saying, um, hey, can you share what you know? Um, I learned from them that most of the time they had adequate insurance. They had adequate income. So what was going on and found that a lot of the time um, it was the provider or the cancer center that they were receiving mm -hmm. care where that was the barrier. That was the block um, as far as um, not providing them with quality standard of care and unbeknownst to them, they were not aware of what they should be receiving for standard of care. And so um, my little checklist that I created for myself just to make sure that I was getting the best care. So, you know, when you think about checking off all the boxes, so not just making sure that you're getting the right treatment for yourself. I was diagnosed in Novo. Um, I had, of course, tumors all over my body, except for my brain and my spine. You know, I um, had to make sure that, you know, I, I did, got the second opinion, um, looked into clinical trials, uh, hormone positive, HER2 negative, um, but because I had, you know, 60% of my liver taken over by cancer tumors, it was really important for me to start chemotherapy. So I decided to go that route um, and got the best care possible. But also, how could I support myself with um, making sure that I could get that reinforcement with integrative therapies to make sure that I could sustain myself um, through uh, chemotherapy for that year? And so I ended up doing chemotherapy for a year regional evidence of disease, and now I'm on endocrine therapy and still, you know, getting my scans every three months and taking care of myself and all of that, um, but being monitored, but um, ended up taking my little checklist and sharing it with other organizations and collaborated on some projects, was really successful, um, but learned that, you know what, um, these were just one and done projects and the need is really gr great. And so decided to go ahead and launch the Chris List Initiative. And that's what we're doing all the time now. So my little checklist is now a coaching program for women with breast cancer. It is now um, an app for uh, you know, breast cancer patients to take advantage of. And we also teach um, healthcare providers and cancer centers how to make sure that women of color get equitable care. And we also assess whether or not if they're giving equitable care. So when I was invited to join today, I was thinking, well, am I living boldly? <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm just doing what I can. I'm helping myself, but I'm also helping others. Um, but I do think that cancer is really clarifying. I believe cancer is clarifying because, you know, you're, I feel that, you know, especially being metastatic, I don't know how many good days I'm going to have. I don't know what is slated for tomorrow. Um, so I really savor those moments. Um, I'm very gracious with myself. And so I feel that we are responding a lot of times to all of the uh, pressures that people um, put on us, or we're trying to um, meet all the demands of everyone, right? So we want to be that good wife. We want to be that good mom. We want to be a good daughter and a sister and a friend. Um, but first and foremost, I've learned that because of that unpredictability, um, I have to make sure that I'm good first. I can't be good to anybody else unless I make sure that I'm good first and foremost. And so that takes a lot of mindfulness where, you know, there could be times when I'm triggered, you know, by something or I'm stressed. If I'm, you know, noticing that I'm irritated, you know, take a moment and figure out what am I irritated by? <laughs> Let's not just, you know, roll through that, but just taking the time to really think about, you know, what's going on? Am I good? Before setting out to do anything else for anybody else. And I think um, we have the opportunity to take these really stressful, painful um, experiences like cancer. Um, and really, um, it makes you, it, it clarifies 
making sure that you're prioritizing yourself first and foremost, you are setting aside that time for those things that give you joy, like Andrea was talking about. And um, also making sure that um, your circle is solid, it's tight. So meaning if you are putting forth the energy and effort into other people, making sure that those other people are reciprocal in that and that they are in your corner and have your back as well. Um, and there is this, you know, I feel that if you are interested in advocacy, there's so much opportunity right now to take your experiences. We are not accepting status quo anymore. I am so proud of the fact that I am board president of MetaViver because I feel in, in my personal opinion, and I know I'm biased because I'm, you know, metastatic, but I feel that breast cancer is breast cancer. If you are diagnosed at an earlier stage, you know, that indicates what treatment that you should receive. Um, but more than likely, you're going to be on some type of maintenance or monitoring for the rest of your life. And it impacts you for the rest of your life. Hence why we have this YSD summit. But if you're metastatic, you know, the only way that we're going to extend lives now and metastatic patients are living longer. We live, you know, on average for five years, just like, you know, the success that, um, you know, earlier stage and cures claim, you know, but really what's going to make the difference in breast cancer is if we're living longer, we can hopefully make this a chronic illness and um, it has to be the research. So this year we're focused on having a banner year for MetaViver where we are raising more and more dollars on research that's gonna to go to metastatic breast cancer and that benefits all stages, not just metastatic um, because my youngest was kin in kindergarten when I was diagnosed and I intend to meet my grandkids and I intend to see him graduate from college and then for him to become rich and successful and take care of his mom. And so <laughs> we have to have more and more um, therapies and research in order to do that. So um, please uh, support MetaViver, look out October 13th for Light Up NBC and um, also make sure you look out for C2C as well. And um, you know, we have to push uh, these HCPs, policy researchers, making sure that our care is good, that it's equitable, that our costs are covered, and these treatments have to meet our needs. So sharing your experiences, being vocal, however it is you can be an advocate, even if you're just, you know, telling a researcher or participating in, you know, developing support, whatever the case may be, share your story, share your experience so other people can learn from that and they can do better because I'm so surprised by how many experts we think there are out there, but they don't know more than we do. And so the only way that things are gonna get better is if we take that time to be bold, look people in the eye and say, you know what, this is what you need to do better. And so I'm really excited because the Chrysalis Initiative and the work we're doing is equalizing and making sure that black women are not falling through the cracks and are receiving quality standard of care. I'm excited about the work that we're doing with MetaViber because we're, we're funding the research projects that are gonna extend lives across the board. And more and more um, treatments have to be developed in order for us to um, live with this disease longer and better. You know, because it's not great if you are, you have breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer and you're miserable or in pain or not able to live your life and have a high quality of life. So it really is important. And I would just say that be gracious with yourself. We're, you know, this is hard. Um, tap into those mental health resources. If you're not sure where to receive them, you know, tap into organizations like YSC and the Chrysalis Initiative and MetaViver to tap into that support. Um, and as far as intimacy goes, you know, take your time with that too. There shouldn't be any pressure there. You know, I'm still married. <laughs> And um, I can tell you that has been a learning experience because, you know, when you have breast cancer treatments, that's an ongoing thing. You know, your side effects and symptoms are going to change as you go through all these um, treatments and things like that. Be gracious with yourself, be patient with yourself, and you don't have to figure thing, everything out right away. And I would just say that sometimes cuddling is enough. Sometimes, you know, snuggling is enough. And then when you're ready, you know, just find out what works for you. And, you know, um, hopefully you have a partner and that you guys can um, level on each other and nurture each other so that there isn't that pressure there. 
but it really, you have to allow yourself that flexibility and openness to allow yourself to um, learn what works for you. And I can say that I've been living with NBC now for four years. I didn't find the best solution until halfway through. <laughs> you know who knew it was you know you're trying all these different things and then finally you know got that uh, golden ticket and found that you know uh, routine that works for me so I mean you're gonna have to just learn how to be patient with yourself um, be gracious uh, factor in and spend that time on those things that give you joy and if that's advocacy get involved um, so that things can get better for everyone all around and Thank you for letting me rant, you know, <laughs> here today. Um, so I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Jamil, thank you so much. Just so inspiring to hear everything that you're doing. We've got lots of people in the comments um, just sending you so much love saying, wow, like you're amazing. You're incredible with all this advocacy you're doing. People also in the comments saying they can't wait to tell their own uh, health care team about your initiative so this Yay. is what we do we're spreading the word it's happening it's happening and just a reminder um, to everybody if you have questions for our lovely lovely panelists uh, this afternoon or this evening wherever you are please do put your questions um, it's not in the chat box but it's it's uh, it's in the same section as the chat box please put them there we can't wait to get to the Q&A at the end and um, we're going to go to our last panelist now, Anna Krollman. Anna uh, is the uh, founder of My Cancer Chic, and she's got some slides as well. So I'm really excited to see what she's gonna be saying. Passing it over to you, Anna. Tonight, I feel like this is such a full circle evening for me um, because YSC in 2016 was when I first found my family. And I say that that summit in 2016 changed my life and it may seem extreme to say that, but prior I was diagnosed at age 27 with triple positive um, breast cancer. And I was on the road to try and have a baby. I had just bought a house. I was a newlywed and suddenly cancer comes along and completely changes my world. As all of you all that are here, either know firsthand or know with a loved one. And for a long time, and I say long time, but it, it was only six months, but six months can feel extremely long when you're going through cancer. So for six months, I felt like I was the only young person with cancer out there in the world. I was going to my cancer center, begging for other young women and everyone they were connecting with me with were women that already had children or already were in that chapter of their life. And I desperately wanted to find young women like me that were going through cancer prior to motherhood and could relate to that type of experience that I was having. And so for me, fertility was such a huge piece of my grief and my journey because I had my sights set on this idea of becoming a mother and being triple positive. I had learned from my treatment care team that I would be on hormone blocking medicine for a long time. So there was a lot of grief and anxiety and um, kind of going back and forth, trying to convince myself that I was okay with this. Sometimes I wasn't. Andrea, I think spoke to this of just, you know, there are times when you're doing well and you do feel joy and there's times when you don't and accepting both of those. Um, and for me, I struggled particularly at the beginning to find that joy because I couldn't find my people. And I am definitely an extrovert. I mean, my people and being able to find people that could I could relate to was so important. So fast forward to February of 2016, walking in the room and I hope that every single one of you gets to enjoy this next year. Hopefully next year we will all be together walking in the room in Atlanta and seeing 1,200 other young women that looked like me. And I don't mean looked like me physically, but walking around and seeing bald heads and seeing port scars and seeing head scarves and seeing like that trauma and yet that joy all in one when we were walking around and meeting each other was really life-changing for me. And 
I decided that I wanted to do something more to give back to the community. And so since I couldn't find a lot of what I was looking for in terms of resources, I decided to create a lot of it myself. Um, and that particularly was focused on the style and beauty and confidence aspect of cancer that I think we get so much stolen from us when we're going through a cancer journey. And I know if you're anything like me, um, insecurity comes whether you have cancer or not. So you add cancer on top of that and you've got a big whammy. So that's why I founded My Cancer Chic, which is a lifestyle brand. And it's followed my cancer journey, my infertility journey, and now my life um, as a person um, having gone through cancer six years in remission. I will be celebrating seven years this summer and I have my sweet two-year-old um, son that I was able to have after cancer. So I've kind of chronicled my own own journey after cancer and I share my passion for beauty and style which I feel like um, can be amazing tools and resources as you're going through your cancer journey to find yourself again find confidence with yourself and really express yourself but all of that just to give you a little background on me tonight I'm actually going to be talking to you about navigating mental health and Jamil and um Andrea both spoke to this, that mental health is a huge aspect of the cancer journey. And I want you to, for a second, think about everything that you've gone through. And then imagine that you knew someone going through that. And if you looked at somebody else going through everything you've gone through, you would be in shock and awe of what they've been able to go through. But a lot of times we don't give ourselves that credit. And so I want to start my story about navigating mental health by first talking about my story with depression. And so I had experienced depression off and on throughout my life, just dealing with the normal challenges of life, losing a loved one or going through trauma, or I had a very difficult job and dealing with the anxiety and stress of that. But when things got really, really bad for me in my cancer journey was when I was getting to the end of chemo. For so long throughout treatment, I was focused on here's the next appointment and go to this and here's your treatment and here's where you need to be and someone's checking on you. And suddenly you start nearing the end of chemo and you're starting to think about navigating life without those guardrails, without that protection. And I started to feel this overwhelming sense of dread and pressure on my shoulders. And I, was, I started thinking about how am I gonna make my life worth it? I started going down these rabbit holes of how do I make my survivorship worth it? How do I kind of live beyond this in a way that is worthy? And that started creating a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression for me. I felt like I went from one minute celebrating finishing chemo to the next minute having this giant cloud of depression over my head and not really being sure where to go next and not sure how to navigate that, who to talk to. And keep in mind, this was also before I had gone to YSC. So I didn't have my people yet. I didn't know that this was normal in the community. And so that was a really, really pivotal moment in my cancer recovery. And so, like I said, I had this feeling of, oh, wait, I should be celebrating being alive. I made it through. I had a double mastectomy. I'm beginning reconstruction. I'm on hormone therapy. Like I did egg preservation and embryo freezing and I did the chemo and I had the port and all the things. And yet somehow I was laying in bed crying every day and I didn't want to get up and I didn't want to go to work and I didn't want to see people. And there was this fear of what comes next. And so I want to call out for all of you all here tonight, some things to look for. And I am not a medical professional. We have some medical professionals right here on the call. Um, but this is from my experience and the research that I've done since about mental health, particularly in the cancer space. Now, one thing to keep in mind, there is a caveat, and that is that a lot of these signs are also very normal reactions to cancer right? So it is difficult sometimes to see the difference. But for me, what was really meaningful was as the active treatment started to uh, wrap up, 
and I was still experiencing these symptoms to such an extreme, that's when I started saying, hmm, this seems like a sign that maybe something is going on, maybe something bigger than me processing my cancer journey. And so some things to think about, you know, if you are withdrawing from loved ones, if you're withdrawing from friends, if you really don't want to see anyone all the time, right? We all have those moments when we just need some alone time and that's not concerning, but sometimes withdrawing really extremely intense emotions that are interfering with your life and inability to get out of bed, to go to work, things that are like normal parts of your life that bring you joy normally or are part of your routine. If you're feeling things that are strong enough to keep you from doing those, these are just a couple signs to keep in mind. And so in my case, since I was lucky enough to have experienced depression before I knew what to look for. And I was able to be self-aware enough to say in that moment, okay, I think I'm feeling some red flags. I think I'm feeling some signs and I need to do something about this because I don't want to feel like this. And so that then takes me to my next point, which is please do not be afraid to ask for support. And just a little side story, this photo up on the screen is actually of me and my husband at the YSC Summit in 2016. And so it just makes me so happy to this day. I, I just met so many wonderful people at that event and just seeing the photo just makes me so happy and brings back happy memories. But don't be afraid to ask for support, especially as women, we are so conditioned to believe that we are superwoman and we should be able to do everything on our own. And we are superwomen. I mean, I'm not trying to take away from that. We are bold and we can do a lot, but we shouldn't do a lot by ourselves. And Jamil spoke to this, that if you don't take care of yourself, you're not able to serve others. You're not able to get involved and do the other things that you really wanna do with your life and the people you wanna support. And I pulled the statistics out, um, the statistic out from MD Anderson, because I remember the first time I read it, it really hit me hard. 15 to 25% of people diagnosed with cancer also suffer from depression. That's a big number. So if you are feeling any of these feelings, just know that it is completely normal. So where do you turn to for support, right? This is going to be different for every single person. It might be your friends. It might be your family. It might be your spouse. It might be a coworker if you're very close with someone. For me, it was my husband and my cancer support center. My cancer support center, I was lucky enough to have a therapist on site that was able to see patients that specifically had the expertise to work with someone that has cancer. And that is a wonderful, valuable skill if you can find someone that has experience in that because they just have different contexts about how to deal with what you're going through. Um, other therapists, cancer organizations like YSC, like Living Beyond Breast Cancer, like the Chrysalis um, Initiative, like any of these amazing organizations have resources on mental health and your survivor community. If you're a part of the YSC Facebook group, if you have survivor friends that you found on Instagram, on Facebook, reaching out to them to share your feelings and say, hey, do you have resources you can share? Do you have recommendations? I think that's a great place to start. And then this is my little recipe for healing. This is not going to be the perfect mix for everyone, but this is these are a few of the things that helped me heal from my depression. So one was creating exercise routines. I had gotten into very poor routines with chemotherapy, as well as losing a lot of my energy. And that I had lost kind of that dopamine that you get when you're exercising, that feeling and your endorphins that are um, being released. I missed that. And so I started building in walks every day. And how do I have small routines of exercise? That really helped my mental state as well as my physical. I made small diet changes, little things about just putting energy back into myself and my well-being. For me, sleep was a huge issue. I wasn't sleeping because of my anxiety. And so when I started going to my therapist, she said, you know what? The first thing we need to do is get your sleep in, in check because you can't sleep, you can't heal, and that's impacting your mental health. And so I did start taking medication at the time for anxiety and sleep. And what do you know, as I started working on those things, I was able to heal in other places. Now, I'm not saying that medication is the right route for everyone, I'm just sharing some of the things that were in my recipe that helped so that you know what some of your options are. Um, continued therapy. I've literally been in therapy with my therapist for, I think, almost going on 11 years now. I've been with her um, since prior to my diagnosis, and I went back to her after a time with a cancer therapist. Um, celebrating your milestones, and Andrea talked about this, but small milestones, right? I started by celebrating when I felt good enough to get out of bed. 
Then I started celebrating the first time I actually wanted to go have brunch with my girlfriends again. I celebrated when I got joy from going on a date with my husband or my, you know, things like that, little small things for yourself, celebrating those to recognize the growth that you're having with your mental health. It's not the big vacation. It's not the, oh my God, I finally feel like myself again. It's the small steps along the way and recognizing that that is progress. For me, it was also a lot of self-compassion work. During chemo, I mentioned that I had a lot of issues with insecurity, and then you add in the grief of cancer and the trauma of uh, body, your body being disfigured through surgeries and treatment. And so for me, self-compassion work, particularly with mindful self-compassion, there's an amazing workbook um, that I recommend by Kristen Neff, who is an amazing um, psychologist, I think. Highly, highly recommend her works. Those were so powerful for me in my healing um, from both depression and just insecurity and self-doubt. And then finding your tribe, which I think is why so many of you are here today. And this weekend is to find those people that bring you joy and bring you that community and that comfort. Whether you are down or up, you need those people that can meet you in both places. And for me, that was what YSC brought. YSC was the community that could relate to me when I was down and help me get through those difficult moments and also celebrate those milestones and those moments of joy with me. And so that's why I'm just so glad to be here today. And lastly, remember that you are not alone. These are two wonderful women and close, close friends of mine that I met at the YSC Summit many, many years ago. Um, and while we have lost our dear friend, Melissa, in this photo, um, it just having her in my life and having Christine in my life, who's in this photo, um, has taught me that I'm not alone no matter what I'm going through. And I want each of you here tonight to know that and know that all of us are here cheering you on and part of that community. And I did want to share that tonight's presentation that I did actually stemmed from and was inspired from an article that I wrote for the Wildfire Breast Cancer Magazine, and it's actually a podcast as well. And so the title is Combating Post-Cancer Depression. So I only shared a few tidbits from that topic tonight, but if you're interested, um, just check out you know all the resources. You can see that podcast or um, read the article and Wild. Fire Magazine is another great resource um, for all of you guys with amazing stories about breast cancer thrivers and survivors and everyone navigating breast cancer. Oh gosh, sorry. And just, I know we're going to do questions now, but I'd love to connect with all of you. Um, uh, my handle is at MyCancerChic on all social medias and my blog is MyCancerChic.com. Back to you, Emma. Thank you so much, Anna. I cannot tell you how much I related to everything that you were saying. And apparently I'm not alone because so many <laughs> people in the comments are going, me too, me too, is she talking about me? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and you're so right. It's such, it's such an important aspect of dealing with cancer. And unfortunately we don't always get the support that we need. And I, I also, very much related um, to what you're saying about, you know, having pre-existing depression and anxiety. I was in the same boat and I loved your reframe of um, you were lucky that you'd had it before because you knew the, the signs to look for and you knew to ask for help. And I thought that was a really lovely way um, to think of things. And I, I, I'm going to think of, think that way about myself too. So thank Yay. you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. I'm so glad. We are I'm so glad too. And do you know what also is lovely, Anna, is lots of people are sharing in their comments their own little healing recipe tips, which I think is so Yay. lovely. Please, everyone, put those in, in the comments because it's so nice for everyone else to be reading them and be reading what everybody else's tips are. And uh, speaking of the comment section, please do also put your Q&A in there. Uh, if you have any questions for the Q&A, we're starting the Q&A now. And the first question that we have actually ties in very nicely to what you were just saying, Anna, um, about what would be your biggest piece of advice to a young survivor or thriver who is feeling stuck or unsure of how to move forward? And this and this question is for is for everybody. And I know Anna, you were sort of talking about that that feeling of feeling lost, feeling helpless, particularly maybe if you're coming to the end of a portion of your treatment. And we had lots of people in the comments as well saying that that was something that they really struggled with and didn't and didn't feel feel prepared for. Um, but I open up to up to you, ladies. Any piece of advice for someone who's feeling stuck and unsure what to do? 
Ooh, we'll chat for support. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, I know it seems like a weird step. You're unsure of who to call, but um, who did you reach out to that you do you feel that you can be open with? Um, sometimes it is just, you know, picking up the phone and talking to someone who you, who you trust. Um, and maybe they can help walk you through um, finding that support. But also there's so many great organizations um, that are available to you that could facilitate you getting that support that you need in order to help you get unstuck. And so, of course, I'm going to say Chrysalis, Metaviver, YSC, LBBC, you know, those are great organizations where um, we're going to be alerted and on deck once, you know, someone reaches out for support. Or if you connect more so with uh, your cancer center, where they typically have um, a psychotherapist or therapy resources or support group for you to connect with. And everyone has different ways of tapping into that support. So don't think that there's something wrong with you if that first thing that you tried didn't work. I know me, I did everything because who knew, who knew what was going to fit? You know, so I had the support group, I had the peer group, I had, you know, the psychotherapist and the therapist and, you know, all of that. So I think, you know, see what works for you, you know, put your toe in and then you can finally move um, along more so um, to see what works for you. I love that. I think one thing I would add to that too is in addition to seeking the support, I think if you're feeling stuck, it might also be helpful to do some reflection on what you see as maybe your interest or your passion for the future. I know for me, I was so focused on motherhood that I wasn't quite sure now that that was taken off the table for me, I wasn't quite sure what my next step could be. And so I did a lot of what Jamil said in terms of trying different things. Like I started volunteering with YSC. I became a face-to-face -face leader. I started going, you know, to, to different events for breast cancer survivors and meeting with hospitals to say, is this what I want to do? Then I started writing more and publishing my writing. And then I got into more of my blog work. And so just trying different things to see what brings you joy and passion now, because it might be different than what you had before. And I think doing that reflection work, doing that self-compassion work to give yourself space and time to reflect and just say, hey, the world is my oyster now and I don't have to decide. I literally could do nothing for years and that's totally fine. I could just live my normal life. Like that's okay. Or mm -hmm. I could go volunteer if you could do anything and giving yourself the space to feel that I think would be, would be my piece of advice. Andrea? Um, I think sometimes it's okay to be stuck, like lean into the stuck, mm -hmm. you know, stuck isn't necessarily stuck. Sometimes it's grief of, okay, I was going to go right, but now this road has turned me left. And sometimes you need to be stuck. You need to cry in the stuck and grieve that path that you were going on, right? Because if you're stuck, it means you got stopped somewhere on the road. So. Sometimes I think a big thing is we don't give ourselves enough permission to be sad, right? To be um, angry and to feel all the feelings before we go. Okay, you know, um, one of my favorite quotes is, you can have a pity party, you just can't stay there all night. You're allowed <laughs> to have a pity party. You, you know, I have pity parties for myself, but they are timed. It's, I'm gonna have a pity party today and I'm gonna Netflix and turn off my phone and I don't wanna deal with the world and eat a pint of ice cream. And, but tomorrow I'm going to commit to myself that I'm going to do one, two, or three, right? Because we don't mourn, I think enough loss and loss can be anything loss of, I wanted to go on a trip and I didn't get to go on a trip and that's why I'm feeling stuck. So I think together we gave you some good tidbits. That was so beautiful, Andrea. Thank you so much. I, I actually reminded me of something that I saw on Nightbird's Instagram and I know we've got people in the comments remembering her and thinking about her this weekend as well and she shared a video where she was talking about grief and she said grief is your body's way of saying this mattered mm -hmm. what I lost mattered and I think that is so that's just so beautiful that really got to me and and you know thank you for just bringing the honesty and and yeah we need to give ourselves we need to give ourselves more credit, you know? We've mm -hmm. been through so much. We're going through so much. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's okay to be stuck. 
The next question uh, is comes from somebody that, that wants to know or, sh or is sharing that she feels like people expect her to do something great after breast cancer and to be a hero. And she feels guilty because, or she or they just want to live a normal life. And they would like to know any tips for balancing that? I don't care about what those people think. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Literally, it's like, what, what matters to you? Because you lived it, this is your life. You're still here, that's enough. You know, if, I mean, <laughs> I, I find that like so incredible that people feel that they can take make claims on what you should be doing. You're doing it. It's your energy. It's your life. It's your time. So don't care about what those people think. And just say, you know, you're good. You're maintaining. You know, you went through what you went through. If you want to chill for a bit, that's totally okay. Let them go be a hero. What are you, what are they doing? <laughs> where are you volunteering you know don't worry about what I'm doing you know and actually you could be inspiring people just breathing and living and putting one foot in front of the other mm -hmm. as simple as that sharing your experience or even if you don't share your experience because that's okay too you could keep it to yourself but we really should be based off of what makes you what fills your cup what do you want to do what matters to you because Cancer is clarifying. I say it all the time. It, you cannot waste your time or um, you know your joy on trying to please other people. I know that's hard because we, you know, we're good people. We want people to, you know, be proud of us and love us and like us and all of that. But sometimes you just have to assert yourself, and it's more important how you feel about yourself. Yeah, I think sometimes we are our own biggest critic, right? And so we come to conferences like this and we see all these wonderful advocates and going, oh, am I not doing enough? And we create it ourselves. Like, should I be doing more? And, and it's giving yourself, you know, a lot of it is giving yourself permission to be different, right? We have advocates and we have people that don't want to advocate, you know, it looks different, but sometimes it's taking what we're doing here and understanding that we all don't have to be speakers, right? We all don't have to be present. We all don't have to open up a nonprofit. We can find our own way. And it's giving yourself some self-compassion to find your own way. I think I'm my biggest critic. I always get a little intimidated and I'm like, hmm, am I doing enough for the cancer community right now? But I have to check myself and say, I'm doing it in a way that's comfortable for me. And that's okay. I think that's such a good point. It all goes back to showing yourself grace and knowing that it healing and the process is going to be cyclical. It's not going to be linear. And so even if you are in a place now where you're feeling like maybe this pressure to be a hero or to do this, and you just want to kind of live your life a hundred percent, just live your life just do what you want to do, just do what feels good and what feels fulfilling to you, but also leave space that you may feel different in two years. Maybe in two years, you get an opportunity to share your story. And, you know, also like that may be fulfilling at that point. And I think um, Camille said this, Jamil, I'm sorry, <laughs> said this, that, you know, you also don't know who you're inspiring by just living your life. And that is so powerful because not everything is the outward hero, right? The person that is the face of something or does the nonprofit or does the advocacy. There are thousands of people out there every day that are inspiring just by living their lives and just by carrying on. That is inspiring enough. And so don't, I, like Andrea said, don't put that pressure on yourself. I mean, I do. I'm with you. We, we all do that, but we can sit here and say our advice is not to, um, and to kind of find that peace with yourself. I love that. And I love the way uh, we, it was Jamil, you said cancer is clarifying. Oh, I yeah. love that because it's like, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be, it doesn't have to be a lesson. It's clarity. And what if the clarity is, is that, you know what? Your life was pretty darn great the way it was before. And maybe that's how you want to be living your life. I remember <laughs> a therapist said, said that to me early on, but yeah, I know uh, it's something we all struggle with that balance. 
Uh, okay, and we've got lots of questions coming in now. Uh, the next question is to everybody, what are some of your non-negotiable self-care tips? What, what stuff that you do not miss out? Uh, well, I would say my time is my time. I'm gonna occupy my time with what I wanna do. And um, if I need to just sleep in, that's okay. If I need to have ice cream, that's okay too. If I need to exercise or go on a walk or act, actually have like a do nothing day, that's fine. Um, and me, I love, you know, just, I'm a Taurus. So I love, you know, like the bubble baths and lotions and, you know, just that self-indulgence. I love that. Um, but I, you know, I kind of listen to how I'm feeling. So if I need to watch some stand-up comedy, if I need to talk on the phone with a girlfriend, you know, I'll do that. If I just need to hug and snuggle with my family, that's fine. But it's really just um, the non-negotiables are when people try to infringe or dictate, you know, what you should or should not be doing. Um, I'm, I hold firm. I'm like, you know, no, this, this is what I need. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm a little stubborn, but I think you have to take care of yourself first before you can be good to anybody else. Mm -hmm. I, love that. I think my non-negotiable is say no <laughs> like I, I don't you know if it's not a heck yes it's a no right and giving myself permission to think about things like thinking about presenting it it took me I gave myself 48 hours before I made a decision you know that's my non-negotiable self-care because when I start saying yes to things that I don't want to do that's when I get a little squirrely. Well, you stole mine because I was going to say the same one. I used to be just a yes to everything and then over, ended up overextended. And so I think that has been cancer is clarifying. It has clarified for me that I need to protect my space and my energy more. And so saying no has been really powerful that for that. I think another thing that is a non-negotiable for me is making sure that I have quiet alone time. As an extrovert, this was something that was a little bit foreign to me before, but now I don't know if it's just after cancer or aging, I need alone time to be with my thoughts, whether they are negative, <laughs> depressing, sad, or amazing or joyful. Like I have to protect that time at least, you know, a couple times a week to just say, I'm going to sit with this and I have to process what I'm going through. And so that's non-negotiable for me now in order to then, as Andrea said, say yes or say no, because if you're not giving yourself the space to process and reflect, you don't know how you really feel and you don't know how you're going to go into those situations. So I think those would be my two. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing everybody. I think we have time for one more question. Someone is asking, or they're saying, I'm considering dating again with metastatic disease. What are suggestions to approach the topic when that, come, when that time comes? In general, how do I talk to people in my life about a breast cancer diagnosis? Uh, I can't say that I'm dating, but I would just say, don't feel that you have to post a sticker on your head and say, hey, I have MVC when you're dating someone. Date, be open, get to know people. And then if that person is special enough or you think that you want them to stay around a while, you know, you can start sharing, you know, what you're going through. You know, I actually have um, breast cancer and it's metastatic, meaning that, you know, it's spread. And depending on where you are with your treatment, you can kind of share some, you know, statistical facts and information with that person. What does that mean as far as personally, as far as your treatment and your trajectory? Um, but really just saying, hey, this is something I live with and I deal with, and this is how it affects me. This is what it is. And, you know, let me know if you have any questions, but don't feel that you have to announce to everyone that you meet that you have NBC. Share that with when you think that that person is, you know, solid and should be in your circle. Well said. Um, Brene Brown talks about marble jars. And that's how I operate with a lot of my relationships, right? People earn the marbles. So they earn the right to hear my story. I start out with, I've had some health issues. I test the water, see how that person responds. And then I may go on to share a little more. Or I may go, oh, I did not like that response. So I'm going to back up, right? It's my story. 
And so I share it and we can share it in very small, allowing people to earn the marbles, earning the right to hear your story, whether it's dating, whether it's friendship, you know, you don't owe anybody an explanation for anything, right? I can say, I don't want to go out because I'm tired. Or I can say, you know what, my illness really causes a lot of fatigue and this is what I'm dealing with. Either door is correct. I don't think I have anything valuable to add to that. I think that was fantastic <laughs> advice. Uh, but yeah, the, the only other thing that I was going to mention is humor. Um, I think if you do decide you want to bring it up from those friends that I have that have been dating after cancer, um, humor is a really great tool and can kind of do what, what Andrea was saying to test the waters a little bit and might make it a little bit more comfortable to have what is probably a pretty serious um, conversation with someone that maybe you're not um, on that level of seriousness with yet. I think it's very good advice there for anybody, no matter no matter the stage of, of your diagnosis. I love that marble jar. I think I've got a, a few people in my life that I should probably be implementing that system for, it has to be said. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna squeeze in one last question, okay? Because I think this is, is a lovely question. Someone wants to know what are some easy ways to start if they want to help other survivors and thrivers? Well, I'll say the most obvious one, which is share your story. I mean that you have no idea how much just sharing your story makes a difference. And even if you don't, even if people don't hear your story today, someone may hear that story that you shared, you know, three years down the line. Someone at your work may find out and be diagnosed and come to you and know that. And so, you know, whether you're sharing on social media, if you tell a small group of women, if you tell your, you know, your um, religious group, anything that feels comfortable to you, I think that's the, the easiest step. But also, if you don't want to share your story, that's okay. So don't feel pressured. <laughs> but that to me is um, a great place to start. Yeah, I would just say that um, helping can be done in so many different ways. You could, you know, volunteer for an organization that's carrying out the work either by fundraising or maybe even um, being available at the hospital to speak to you know people that are newly diagnosed. Um, the Chrysalis Initiative, we always need coaches, you know, people that have an active diagnosis, earlier stagers or thrivers that can help newly diagnosed folks learn, you know, what they can expect. Um, also, you know, support groups, we always need, you know, new advocates to review grants. <laughs> for Metaviver, um, or to speak to our legislators as far as, you know, for them to understand what needs to happen uh, as far as improving breast cancer care and research. And, um, you know, we even need volunteers for our peer support groups. So there's so many different ways, um, you know, joining an advocacy program, connecting with an organization, finding your tribe, so to speak, and finding what's rewarding for you as far as helping others. I don't have much to add after that. Um, donating, donating money would be the other thing I would add. You know, and again, this is finding what works for you. There are times where we want to be active in the community. There are times where I can send $5 and that's about what I got. So figuring out where on the spectrum and you can go back and forth, you know, their money, writing a check is also super helpful if you can't give your time. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's a great point. So true. So true. I think there's a cancer patient meme about that on the page. <laughs> <laughs> How can I help? Well, you know, <laughs> money is always helpful. Well, ladies, thank you so much for such a wonderful start to this summit weekend. I'm so happy and excited that I got to chat with you all. It was so wonderful. Uh, and before I uh, thank everybody and send you off to the next rooms, Anna, there was a quick question. Could you just mention what that book was again that you talked about that helped you? Yes, it is called um, the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. And I, you can get it on Amazon. It's by Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F. -F. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. So thank you to Anna. Thank you to Andrea. And thank you to Jamil. Wonderful. Okay. And everybody uh, who's watching at home, it's time to head over to your virtual hangouts next, where you can select a group. There's lots of different choices to choose from. So you might want to find one that suits you, or you might want to hop between different ones. Who knows? There's going to be lots of
lovely people in there to chat with. Uh, and all of the information for the virtual hangouts is in the summit schedule on the homepage. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for a lovely session and for the wonderful questions. Hope to see you in the virtual hangouts.